Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and you know the drill, today we complete another episode of our RimWorld Ice Sheet Survival Series. Last time we left off after constructing ourselves a small hospital inside of the mountain base, and also after defeating a psychic ship and its mechanoid inhabitants. For today's episode, we have big plans because most of you were in favor of going after a quest we received last time, which will see us go up against five pirates for a potential reward of a masterwork hospital bed and a uranium plate armor. We are also still hosting a prisoner we captured two episodes ago, and who knows, maybe today will be the day that he finally decides to join us. However, Cambia's first recruitment attempt fails, and so we'll leave him be for the moment. Instead, we can jump over to Giraffe, who is busy refining chem fuel. After all, we have a small dropout attack planned later this episode. Shortly after midnight, then, we can spot Antonio and Cobra in the fields, bringing in a small potato harvest. A few hours later, Antonio then switches over to mining, because we are once again making some changes. I have read your comments on the last episode, and of course you're right, building a hospital underneath the mountain was not the best idea. Due to the risk of infestation, we are unable to heat the place, and that might cause problems with prisoners and patients who refuse to wear warm clothing, something that already happened in the last episode. So instead, we're now building ourselves a new and improved hospital, right here in between the farm and the ancient danger. While we do that, we are also digging out a small corridor from the farm over there, because the chem fuel generators are giving off a decent amount of heat and the hospital can benefit from that. In the meantime, Cobra constructs a second drop pod, because going up against five pirates who probably all have guns is a risky endeavor, and I would like to send at least two of our colonists to attack them. For the time being, we are also flicking off some of the rice farms, simply because we have more than enough at the moment, and we can use the manpower of our two farmers elsewhere. With Cambia's help, we are making good progress in the hospital, and so in the evening, we are ready to spend a sizable amount of silver and steel to construct a sterile floor. And yes, we could have made the hospital a bit smaller, but considering how things out on the ice sheet are likely only going to get more dangerous, we want to have enough space to fit three or four hospital beds, a few vitals monitors, and some medicine shelves in there. A psychic drone then makes things a bit more complicated, because this one is medium level and causes a pretty hefty minus 22 mood penalties for all of our male colonists. I honestly don't know why it's always the males getting hit while Giraffe is happily ignoring all effects, but maybe it's also just bad luck. Keep in mind that we currently also have a male prisoner with psychic hypersensitivity, who will feel this a lot more than our regular colonists and could very well suffer a mental break as a result. To at least somewhat make up for it, Randy sends us one lone cargo pod soon after. Inside, we find 16 doses of Wake Up, which we will of course haul back and hopefully sell off for a nice profit. Cobra and Antonio get the sterile tiles down quickly, and in the early morning hours, our new hospital is almost ready to be used. As expected, our prisoner is suffering heavily under the psychic drone, which currently causes a hefty minus 40 mood penalty thanks to his hypersensitivity, and completely negates all positive mood effects. At this point, I think a mental break can be expected, unless the drone ends quickly. But we also have some good news, the hospital floor is finished and we can now move the bed and the lamp inside. While Cambia and Cobra take care of that, we have a rescue quest pop up, which would give us another colonist. If we are able to defeat two enemies, two turrets and a mortar, we can free a 42-year-old gardener and add her to our colony. The enemy numbers seem pretty manageable. On the other hand, we already have a dedicated gardener in Antonio, so I'm not quite sure if we should pursue this quest any further. As always, let me know what you think in the comments below, but for today's episode, we have another quest to focus on, marked on the left side of the map here. With the hospital interior put into place, we are almost ready to move our prisoner over there, but before we do, we want to make sure that temperatures are not an issue. To use this place as a prison, we will need to keep all doors closed, so the small heat corridor from the generators will not be that useful, and that is why constructing another heater might be a smart idea. 
In theory, we could've also replaced the door on the left with a vent to equalize temperatures, but I like my rooms to have more than one exit if possible, and the door situation is only going to be a problem if we use the hospital for prisoners, not for regular patients. We'll set the heater to a comfortable 15 degrees Celsius that's not too warm and won't consume too much power, but it should be enough so that even a naked colonist won't complain. As Giraffe then runs over to close the second door, we once again have cargo pods crash on the ice sheet. 14 units of medicine wait to be hauled back to the base, and that is an excellent drop that we do not want to miss out on, even though the need for medicine has thankfully been fairly limited so far. Back in the base, Cobra now carries our prisoner over to his new home, away from the farm and into the sterile environment of our brand new hospital. Don't worry though, I have no cruel experiments planned for him at the moment, but as long as we don't use the hospital for anything else, it serves nicely as a prison. Should our prisoner indeed suffer a mental break at some point, he won't be able to damage our crops, generators or the battery, and if he gets injured in the recapturing process, the healing should be a bit faster with the good hospital bed. Our next problem now is food for the huskies, because as you can see, we have run out of pemmican. Our huskies will likely survive for at least another day, maybe even more, but I don't think we have to push them to the limit, so instead we'll have Cobra cook up some new pemmican, after all we have more than enough resources to do so. With the hospital relocation project behind us, we can also devote a bit more time to our rice farms and start sowing out new plants. In the meantime, Giraffe has finished her next sculpture, a normal quality one and this time also not dealing with any sort of body hair. At this point, we can also slowly start the preparations for our drop pod attack by fueling our pod launchers with exactly 23 units of chem fuel that is just enough to get both pods to where we need them to be. Something I just noticed a few seconds after fueling them though is that the two launchers need to be adjacent to each other to launch both pods as a group. With the current setup we would have to launch both pods separately, which might result in them landing on opposite ends of the map. And while this could make for an interesting tactical approach, it's also far less predictable, and so we are now quickly going to improve the setup a bit. Yes, this wastes a few precious resources and we probably should have thought about that from the beginning, but that also goes to show you that in RimWorld there is almost always room for improvements. The construction process doesn't take Antonio too long and technically we are now ready to launch. However, it's also the middle of the afternoon, so our two night owls probably won't be too happy if we send them out now, while Cambia and Antonio will need some rest in a few hours, so I think it's better we wait until we have two freshly rested colonists. In the early evening then, with Giraffe just finishing a steel smelting session, the psychic drone also comes to an end, and so, despite my expectations, our prisoner got through the horrors without breaking. His mood is now slowly recovering, which hopefully also speeds up the recruitment process. Later that evening, with Antonio putting up a few additional defenses, we then receive a cry for help. A 94-year-old woman is being chased by pirates and is now begging for us to take her in and to fend off her attackers. Now in the past, more often than not we ignored these messages, but I think as a service to the elderly we can accept this time. Not because we are good people, I think that ship has sailed months ago, but because we could really use a few fresh bodies for equipment and of course for meat and leather. The enemy numbers seem concerning at first, as a total of 19 pirates are about to attack us in a moment, but I already have a plan that should take out half of them without putting our colonists in too much danger. The refugee, meanwhile, only has very slim chances of survival. At 94 years old, she is very likely suffering from several ailments and will not be of much use to us. As we can see here, her skill set is also not overly exciting, and so, despite the fact that she is a cannibal, we will likely not make her a permanent member of the colony. Her health profile then looks questionable at best, and that pretty much seals the deal. Before things escalate, however, we have some good news as well. Ruby has once again given birth, and our husky colony has a new member. Unfortunately for the huskies, though, that increase is only temporary, because Cricket here will be slaughtered immediately. For that reason, I have also decided not to change the name using the patron naming rights tier this time, but for any colonists or animals who stay with us a bit longer than just a few seconds, we will still do that, of course. 
At this point, the enemies have reached the ice sheet and yes, the group here looks a bit intimidating. 19 pirates, most of them equipped with solid weapons, that could be a problem if we're not careful. However, as I mentioned, we have a plan. We could, of course, simply let our traps take care of the enemies, which would almost guarantee take out more than half of them without the need of getting involved at all, but that would also waste a ton of steel, so we'll take a different approach. We will still have them go through our stone traps, which hopefully kills two or three of them, before we then open all the doors and funnel them into our kill box. The turrets will be activated, all four colonists will be waiting behind cover, and I think this is going to be a nice bloodbath. Our refugee, meanwhile, will hide in the corner here, ready to take on any attackers with her fists. If for some reason she manages to beat the odds and survives, she might get an honorary place in our colony, but to be honest, I have serious doubts about that. So here we go, the enemies are arriving. I think one or two have already fallen to our traps, but that still leaves a lot for our guns. Thankfully though, their attention is divided between the turrets, our four colonists and our fist-fighting grandmother in the corner, which significantly reduces the threat for each of our individual colonists. And indeed, here we are, the pirates are fleeing already. Our hand-to-hand -hand combat trial is still going on and will even give some turret support from the back, so let's see who comes out of this alive. And just as I say that, we have a winner. Our latest recruit isn't dead yet, but at least down on the ground, while the guy who beat her up is making his escape, sadly without success. Now a downed and injured colonist that we have absolutely no use for, I would say that is an excellent test subject for giraffes' medical expertise. So while the remaining pirates retreat, we are carrying the old woman over to the hospital. A big load of herbal medicine is also being hauled over there. Now, if you think that we are going to have Giraffe patch her up again, I will have to disappoint you. Instead, we are queuing up our very first operation, and I think we'll start by removing one of her kidneys. She will be able to survive with only one, and kidneys are worth a solid amount of money to some very particular traders, so we are making sure we get the absolute most out of her. The surgery is a success and here we can see our very first harvested organ, a kidney with a decent market value of 250 silver. But we are far from done yet, up next we will remove one of her lungs. Once again she can survive with only one and just like kidneys, lungs fetch a good price on the market. Just in that moment, an eclipse settles in, possibly pointing out that things are about to get even darker in our small hospital, because with the lung harvested, we have one more organ left, and unfortunately, no one can survive without a heart. The heart is also the organ worth the most money, with a market value of 500 silver, but of course, you want to save it for last, because you cannot remove organs from corpses. Together with the liver, the kidney, lung and heart are also the only organs that can be sold, anything else like eyes or ears does not fetch anything on the market. Removing the liver will also lead to instant death, just like removing the heart, and since both have the exact same market value, it's up to you what you choose. The harvested organs will of course not remain inside of the prison, instead we'll take them over to the storage room from where we will hopefully be able to sell them soon. In the meantime, the rest of the colony is busy with the repair and cleanup work, although in the grand scheme of things we did not have too much damage, apart of course from our traps. Around noon then, we have a trade ship pass by, and even though it's a bulk goods trader that will likely not buy organs or weapons, we'll take a quick look at their inventory nonetheless. However, the trader will remain in orbit for a few hours, so we are going to haul back a few more things before we then eventually start trading. So here we are, let's get to business. First of all, we will once again purchase all available advanced components, getting our stock up to 9. We will also sell off all of the drugs we have, which is already more than enough to finance the components. Additionally, we're also getting rid of all the sculptures that Giraffe made, and that drives up our profits even more. So in the end, we receive almost 900 silver and two advanced components, definitely a very solid trade.
Now, the organ harvesting did come at a price, namely in the form of a few rather hefty mood penalties. Each organ harvested gives a minus 6 penalty, so in total we're already at minus 18 for all 4 colonists, and then we also have an additional minus 3 because the patient died. In the future, we might therefore restrict things to only 1 or 2 organs and maybe also focus on enemies instead of colonists, which should hopefully keep the penalties in check. Some good news then later that day, an arctic fox has self-tamed and is now on its way over to the colony. And we'll actually give this guy a name because we are going to keep it. The name chosen from the Patreon naming rights tier is Henry after patron Henry Garza Jr. And you're probably now wondering what's so good about an arctic fox that we keep Henry around. Well, for starters, Henry here is of course very well suited for the cold climate with a temperature resistance of up to minus 50 degrees Celsius. Just like the huskies, he is also able to haul stuff for us, although he can't carry quite as much, just about two thirds of what a husky can carry, and is therefore also unable to rescue anyone. So, what's the good thing? Well, Henry here will consume significantly less food than a husky. In fact, he will consume roughly one third of what our huskies eat on a daily basis. That makes sustaining a fox population much easier than a husky population, even though they are not as efficient when it comes to hauling. They also produce a bit of filth and are pretty difficult to train, so we'll see if our animal specialist Cobra will be successful in actually teaching Henry how to haul. But with the cost being so low, I think it's definitely worth a shot. In terms of market value, by the way, foxes are worth roughly the same as huskies and they also breed and mature about as fast, so they can be turned into cash at roughly the same rate. Let's quickly jump back over to our prisoner now, because we have some room to improve here as well. As you can see, our prison cell is currently being perceived as awful and I think we can change that very easily. We can simply borrow one of Antonio's sculptures, he has two so he won't mind, and place them inside of the prison and here we are, now it's a slightly impressive room and it even gives our prisoner a small mood bonus. I have also queued up the construction of a medicine shelf, but that can wait until our colonists are fully rested again. By the way, because I just noticed that our list of resources was getting longer than there is space on the screen, I have turned on the categorized layout that makes things a bit easier on the eye. While we are now waiting for Campia and Antonio to finish sleeping, we can cook up a bit more pemmican with Cobra. After all, we now have another mouth to feed. Cambia is now awake and I was just about to finally get our drop pots going, but instead he decides to throw a party and who can blame him, our colonists aren't exactly ecstatic at the moment. With the party all wrapped up and everyone's spirits a little higher, it is now finally time to do what we had planned from the very beginning of this episode. For our drop pot attack, we'll have both Cambia and Antonio equip slightly more combat oriented headgear before we then begin loading the pots. In case things go wrong, we'll give each of them two meals, so four in total, and to ensure they can fly back in drop pods, they also get 46 units of camp fuel. We also send five components, just in case we can't find any on the map, and should anyone get hurt, some medicine isn't a bad idea either. If possible, I also want to try out something new in this attack, and so we'll send our two IED traps as well, hopefully we can put them to good use. And that's all, let's get the pods loaded up and then launch them over to the pirate base. Right, here we are, Campia and Antonio have arrived and can quickly pick up all the items they brought with them. A first look at the pirate base then reveals nothing out of the ordinary. As expected, we have five enemies against us here, four of them have ranged weapons, but they have no turrets or mortars to back them up. Now, I took a few moments to come up with a plan, but I think I have something that will work. The ruined buildings next to us can be used to our advantage, and that way we don't even have to build anything ourselves, which was my original idea when I packed the IED traps. With the limestone ruin deconstructed, we can patch up the holes in the building next to it, and also build a small corridor for the two traps. We'll make sure that the blast radius of the first trap is not overlapping the second trap, otherwise both will explode at the same time and will likely waste one. Once the setup is constructed, we only need to lure our enemies over there, so let's have Cambia and Antonio take a position behind a few rocks and see if anyone runs into our line of fire. The first few shots are fired immediately, but they don't trigger a counterattack, so we'll have to wait a few moments longer. Thank you. 
And here we go, the enemies are on the move and we'll play it safe, so it's time to retreat. Well positioned Cambia and Antonio outside of the blast radius and now we wait for the enemies to destroy the door and hopefully get blown to bits and pieces. Now the pirates on the right side here could be trouble, but the two on the left started a bit earlier, so they should be through first. And indeed here we go, the door has been breached and one enemy goes down almost immediately. This also causes the others to leave the rest of the wall be. Unfortunately though, our traps only kill two enemies, so we'll have to risk it here for the third and final kill. That's all we need to make the enemies flee, but unless we're quick we could suffer a few injuries. Luckily though, we get the kill in no time and that causes the remaining two pirates to flee, while Cambia and Antonio remain unharmed. Back in the base, our reward for this mission arrives on time, we are now in possession of a masterwork hospital bed and a uranium plate armor, and of course we'll carry both of those items underneath the roof immediately. Back at the pirate base, two enemies were able to escape, but we can still help ourselves to the remains of the three who have fallen before we explore the buildings in the middle of the map. The first one is a rather sizable bedroom where Cambia can get a few minutes of rest, while the other building serves the same purpose but is a bit smaller. Now we could have Cambia and Antonio sleep through the night here, but I think they would prefer to sleep in their own beds, so let's begin deconstructing whatever we can find to obtain enough steel for the trip back home. It only takes a few hours before we can already construct our two pod launches, and while we do, we have some excellent news from the home front. Our prisoner has lost all resistance and now our recruitment attempts actually have a chance of succeeding. So who knows, maybe we'll be able to say hello to colonist number 5 soon. In the meantime, both drop pods have been constructed, but we're not leaving yet. Instead, we'll try to bring with us as much steel as we can carry. Sadly, that's the most valuable thing I was able to find on this map. After a few more rounds of deconstructing, the stockpile is filled and we are ready to load up the parts to capacity. And with that, it's time to leave again. Another mission has successfully been completed and our colony has once again gotten a bit richer. And with Cambia and Antonio landing safely back inside of our small base, I think it's time we make the cut in today's episode. Next time we might finally see another colonist join us, and who knows what else Randy Random has in store for us. Until then, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, then I would be happy if you could leave a thumbs up. Of course, if you want to support the channel further, then you can subscribe to stay up to date, or you can also support the Pete Complete Patreon for a chance to name an animal or a colonist in a future episode. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.